Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, the opportunity to witness the adaptive capacities of, uh, of Harvard turning a cafeteria into a lecture hall is not a small feat. It's the first time I've, I've um, spoken from, from this kind of, uh, of a platform. But so so it's, it's great. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be back in Harvard. Um, uh, especially because my, my title, my personal title, just got shortened until a few days ago. I went around joking that I was the future former Minister of Health of Mexico. Well, now I am the former Minister of Health of Mexico as of um, less than a week. I've, um, I've finished, I've come out of six uh, extraordinary years, um, only last Friday. And this is actually the first opportunity I have to speak in public uh, after my, my tenure. Uh, and according to my calculations, when I finished my term, I was the, the sixth longest serving Minister of Health in the world. So you are witnessing here a rarity in the world, uh, uh, a phenomenon. Um, but it is, it is my, first, my first chance to reflect in public about um, some of the uh, lessons and some of, the, uh, of what I learned in, 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 in this job uh, for, for the past six years. And it is, in it, it is a very symbolic uh, venue um, uh, because uh, it, to me it almost uh, symbolizes a, a cycle that's coming full circle. And of course, if you know anything about um, the pre-Hispanic cultures uh, of ancient Mexico, where they were obsessed with cycles and cycles were everything the world got um, uh, reinvented every 52 years, and cycles are everything. So, for, uh, like Harvard, yes. <laughs> so for me, this is almost like a cycle that's closing. And, and uh, when, when I finished my tenure as the founding director general of the Na National Institute of Public Health in 1992, I came here for, for a sabbatical. And actually, many of the uh, ideas that I'm going to be sharing with you about what's happened in Mexico were actually nourished in this environment. Uh, back in those days. So for me, the most gratifying experience of the last six years has been, as, as Dean Bloom just mentioned, the uh, opportunity to turn a lot of those ideas into action, into action that has transformed reality in my country and also has provided, I think, valuable lessons for other countries. Um, so overall, uh, over all these years, since 1992 at least, Harvard has continued to be very, very directly involved in the reform efforts in Mexico. Um, so, you know, I feel I owe it uh, to you to come back here and tell you what, what have been the fruits of the enormous talent that's housed here in this university. So this is what I want to do in the, in the next few minutes, and, um, and of course I'll be very happy at the end to engage in the discussion. I would like, first of all, to, to share with you what motivated the reform. Why did we carry out this effort? Then, what, very briefly, what were the main characteristics of this reform? And then, importantly, what are the lessons that can be drawn in our globalized world? Most of the details of, of, about the content of the reform are being published in a seven-article series in The Lancet. And as far as I know, this is the first time the Lancet has devoted seven articles to the experience of one country. Um, uh, the first of those uh, papers, which was a little bit of a, of a, a reflection, uh, was published on September the 9th. Um, and I remember because it was the ninth day of the ninth month. Um, uh, so, and then uh, as of the last week of October, Every week, there's been one of the papers being published in the current issue of the Lancet. There's one of the papers being published. Uh, one, by the way, of, of, the, of the seven papers, it, it, it contains the initial results of the evaluation of this reform, the external evaluation that's being carried out here uh, by, uh, at Harvard by the, the Global uh, Health Initiative at Harvard with Chris Murray. It's, the first author is Emanuela Gakidu. And uh, so even some of the initial results are being published uh, in this year. So I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, of the reform itself because this is all available in this seven article series. What I would like to do rather is to share with you my reflections of what uh, all of this experience has meant and what it can mean in, in, in the future. 
And let me start, you know, with the main message that I would like to leave you with. And the, the main message I draw from the conclusions that Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, uh, uh, drew, drew from that conference that Barry Bloom was referring to uh, back in October in, in, in Mexico. And so the, 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 the main message is that a clear ethical framework combined with technical excellence and political skill can deliver really positive results for the most vulnerable people in the world. Um, and, and that's what I will try to, to show how that actually came to be in Mexico. So, you know, I, I like to start, would like to start actually borrowing an idea that uh, I learned here uh, the, by, by uh, my, my friend Michael Reich of the idea that every public policy is sustained on three pillars, an ethical pillar, a political pillar, and a technical pillar. We tend to focus only on the last one, and indeed I will spend most of, the, of this um, lecture on the last one, but we must not forget that every public policy reflects a value set, whether explicitly or implicitly, and that every policy requires a political process. Uh, to, uh, and, 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 and those three pillars are not three separate uh, components. They interact with each other, they develop synergies. In the case of the health care reform in Mexico of the last six years, the ethical pillar was based on a clear notion, the notion that, that access to high quality health care is a fundamental human right. Now that doesn't sound very innovative. The constitution of the World Health Organization says exactly that. The step forward, I think, was the notion that it is not enough to recognize that right but that we must create the social instrumentalities so that it can be exercised in a universal, inclusive, and egalitarian manner, that you cannot exercise your right to healthcare in different ways by discriminating certain groups of society. And that creating beyond the declaration, creating mechanisms so that every person in a society can actually exercise that right in the same way is the key ethical uh, component. So that you actually move to a universal health system in the two meanings of the word universal. One, that it covers everyone, but second, that it covers everyone with the same rules. That is to say universal as the opposite of segregated. Because you could have, and in fact you do have many examples in Latin America and other parts of the world of health systems that have achieved universal coverage in the first sense of the word. Everyone is covered. But everyone is covered with different and fragmented systems and different rules of access and different uh, financial burdens to different groups of, of the population. So we extend the notion to have universal mean exactly the opposite of a segregated or segmented health uh, system. And this, which uh, uh, may sound a little bit general, has very practical implications that I will try to illustrate. For example, as you design a package of benefits as, uh, uh, in, 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 in an insurance uh, scheme, a universal insurance scheme, because that package of benefits is a way of making entitlements explicit. So the way you translate the notion of uh, healthcare as a universal right, that's or as a human right that's exercised in a universal way, is by actually translating that into specific entitlements and provided, providing social instruments for um, uh, uh, accessing that. And I will talk a little bit more about that. The second pillar is the political pillar in the good sense of the word, not the usual sense of the word politics, which is not very, uh, very uh, doesn't have great uh, uh, social acceptability. But politics as the art and science of uh, achieving agreement on shared values and the possibility of reaching consensus, of bringing people together around a shared objective. And again, every public policy must stand on a very firm political pillar. And the third, of course, is the technical pillar, which is what I will uh, devote most of my presentation to. Now, this, these three pillars, like in any structure, interact and reinforce each other. For example, one thing we found in the Mexican reform was that ethical deliberation was an incredibly powerful political tool in, in, in the good sense of the world for reaching consensus. Example, we found out through very good analysis, the technical pillar, through good evidence, we found out that 
Mexico was spending twice, uh, three times as much per capita on insured people than on uninsured people out of public monies. Now, the only th uh, criterion that determines whether you're insured or uninsured is whether you have a salary job. That is to say, your position in the labor market. So it was very interesting to go to the Congress, to the you know, people who actually allocate the budget, and say, so you believe that the life of people should be valued differentially, depending on their position in the labor market. And of course, everyone said, no, 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 no. My value set is that lives are valued equally. Well, your allocation behavior reflects a completely different value set. You're making decisions that literally are life and death decisions, and, and you're differentiating how much money you invest in the health of people based on their position in the labor market. If that is not your value set, you should change that. You should move away from that and begin allocating the budget on an equal basis, on the basis of health need, not on the basis of whether a person has or not a salary job. So the ethical deliberation, making the value set explicit, became an, an enormously powerful tool for the political pillar. And all of that was grounded on the fact that we had done a very good job at uncovering those differences in allocation through very specific methodological tools, many of which actually were, uh, have been developed here at Harvard and in other academic and international organizations. So this is uh, uh, then to, to, to illustrate how the three pillars actually interact with each other. But let me tell you a little bit more on the technical front what the reform was all about. What motivated this, this reform? Uh, the reform is a very simple notion. It's to achieve universal health insurance. Again, not a new idea as such. You know, the world has been proposing this kind of scheme since at least the, the 19th century, um, and most of the uh, industrialized nations of the world have achieved universal health insurance. There's one or two exceptions in the rich world, uh, which will remain unnamed, but uh, this is, again, not a, not a wholly new idea. What is different is that in the developing countries in the 21st century, we are witnessing a whole new dynamic of the relationship, in the relationship between poverty and health. Um, we truly are in an era where we're experiencing a double burden of disease. And again, I won't recapitulate all the work that's been done here at Harvard and in, in, in other institutions, but certainly where Harvard has been a, a world leader on the epidemiologic transition and on analyzing the way in which the epidemiologic transition is not a simple progression from non-communicable diseases, from communicable to non-communicable diseases, but a much more and dynamic process where you have substantial uh, overlapping, where you have counter transitions back and, and, and forth movement, and where you have very often in developing countries a unequal distribution of progress in the epidemiologic transition, which means that you end up having a double burden of disease. We have not, in most low and middle income countries, we have not completely uh, uh, taking care of the unfinished agenda of common infections, maternal deaths, malnutrition, when we're already facing the uh, emerging challenges of non-communicable diseases and, and injury. And that means that we have moved out of a re relatively simple world where priorities were clear-cut and where basically we had a, a world where communicable diseases were the problem of poor countries and non-communicable diseases were the problem of rich countries. And we now have a much more complicated and mixed picture. In most of the poor countries of the world, we have a growing burden of non-communicable diseases so that today we can say that problems only of the poor are not the only problems of the poor. Certain problems only affect poor people. I mean, uh, uh, malaria is, is a good example. But pr problems that are only affect the poor are not the only problems affecting the poor. The poor also suffer from high rates of heart disease, of mental illness, and in general of the non-communicable uh, set of, of problems. And <clears throat> what we're looking at is now a new dynamic because as we progress in this very complex and dynamic transition where the poor are, are overburdened by this double challenge, our health systems have not kept pace with that. This, these are health systems that were def defined and uh, designed for another era. And therefore, most of our countries, certainly it was the case of, of Mexico, 
simply their social instrumentality that we call the health system had not kept pace with the rapid change in the, dominate, the, the dominating pattern of disease, disability, and death in our countries. Therefore, um, as we, uh, in, in a very real sense, became victims of our own success, because it has been the success in child survival, for example, that fuels the epidemiologic transition. It's been the success in reducing fertility that fuels the demographic transition and its implications for the, for the changing pattern of, of disease and disability in the world. We became victims of our own success in, the, in this process, and it was clear that we needed to redesign our health system to uh, face this uh, growing set of uh, much more complex, this much more complex picture. In particular, what we're finding throughout many, many uh, of the poor countries is that health systems are simply insufficiently funded to face this new complex reality. And what happens when you have insufficiently funded health systems is that the financial burden is transferred to families. And all over the world, we are finding growing numbers of households that become impoverished because they have to face a, 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 an episode of illness and they have to pay out of their own pockets. In the case of Mexico, uh, through very detailed analysis, we were able to document a huge burden uh, of financial burden on poor families because of lack of financial protection for all. We also were able to trace that down to the fact that half of the population was uninsured. So approximately 4 million households every year experiencing impoverishing or catastrophic expenditures. Now, what I want to underscore of this experience, quite apart from the details of the ana analysis, which are contained in one of these papers in the Lancet series, is that this is an, a very nice example of the way in which good evidence can shape policy. Because of the dynamic of health and disease, this was a topic that was not even, forget the agenda, was not even in the public debate. You know, because, of course, this is a lot of people who were uninsured, 50 million people, but because of the nature of severe disease, at a given point in time, only a very small fraction of the population is affected by such a disease. So this becomes, these families become invisible, to draw on a term by Amartya Sen. This is, the, 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 we, 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 we reach a phenomenon of invisibility of households experiencing large catastrophic expenditures. So it took very solid analysis to bring that out, to aggregate it through the analytical process, and make it an issue that was in the awareness of the society, and then translate that awareness into a policy, and then translate that policy into a legal reform, and then translate that legal reform into increased allocation and an actual program to generate insurance for the poorest segments of society. So this is where my faith in the value of good analysis, good research, the value of knowledge to transform reality, is probably it has been greatly strengthened by, by this experience. And <clears throat> this process was uh, carried out by applying a lot of knowledge-related global public goods. Um, we know today that a, a large part of the improvement of health conditions particularly during the second half of the, of the 20th century, was driven, was fueled by knowledge. Now, knowledge improves health through three, through three main mechanisms. First of all, knowledge, of course, gets translated into better technologies, better vaccines, drugs, diagnostic methods, and so forth. That's the most commonly known mechanism through which knowledge improves health. But there are two others that we often overlook. Knowledge also is internalized by individuals who then use that knowledge to structure their everyday experience and to generate health-promoting behaviors. I mean, people wash their hands because you know, they're of, of knowledge about the microbial transmission of disease. People change the most intimate parts of their behavior, their sexual behavior, because of knowledge about you know, the way AIDS and other STDs are transmitted. People quit smoking because of knowledge that smoking actually kills you. So knowledge serves to structure everyday experience in vital areas 
like you know, feeding habits, personal hygiene, child rearing practices. The, the most important parts of your everyday life are shaped into health promoting behaviors. And thirdly, knowledge gets translated into evidence and then when you have enlightened policy making, that evidence sh serves to structure the technical pillar of public policy. And this is exactly what happened in Mexico. It's a textbook case of evidence-based policy, where good evidence served to unearth a problem that was not even perceived and put it at the center of the domestic agenda. And it did so through a number of what I just call knowledge-related global public goods. And this is why it's so important to invest in knowledge. Uh, what are those? Well, conceptual frameworks, the WHO framework for health system performance that uh, Chris Murray had so much input to do and uh, it was part of our work in the World Health Organization. Uh, that framework, for the first time, emphasized fair financing as an intrinsic goal of health systems. So health systems are there not just to improve health, but also to do so in a way, in such a way that the burden of financing that health improvement, the burden on society, is distributed in a fair manner. Well, Mexico uh, did very poorly on the fair financing assessment of, of our health system performance. And rather than adopting a defensive position, like other countries did, we actually used that bad outcome, that bad assessment, to make the case for the need for reform. As other countries, by the way, did. Not, it was not just Mexico. Many countries used their bad rating to uh, make the case for the need for reform. So <clears throat> that's one knowledge-related public uh, good. It was produced by the World Health Organization. It's there for every nation to benefit from if we can translate it into the domestic policy uh, arena. Second, measurement methods, a lot of which have been developed here at Harvard. It was, for example, the application of national health accounts where this university has had a very critical role that, again, that's an, a, a global public good. By applying it to the case of Mexico, we were able to document this phenomenon of uh, uh, huge millions of families under, undergoing catastrophic expenditures. Uh, a, a, again, a, 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 a global public good. Um, surveys. Uh, most countries now, as part of their UN requirements, reporting requirements, carry out national income and expenditure surveys, but they have not been fully exploited for health purposes. Well, Mexico had those surveys, as most developing countries, and by applying some of these tools, we were able, again, to generate the evidence that some big change was, uh, was necessary. So uh, it is the application of this knowledge-related public goods brought to the domestic agenda and uh, utilized to take care, to deal, to address a local problem that contains the elements, the, the foundations for the technical pillar of this reform. Now, what happened with all this evidence? Well, <clears throat> we were able then, through, through, through this exercise, to document that faced with the double burden of disease, we had an underfunded health system. Mexico was only spending 5.6% of its GDP on health clearly insufficient to deal with the double burden of disease. Um, furthermore, we were able to document that beyond the problem of the level of funding, there was a huge problem in the origin of funds. Contrary to common knowledge, we documented that most health financing in Mexico had become private out-of-pocket expenditures. There was the preconception that we had a publicly funded health system. People assumed that the government was taking care of health care. Well, the detailed application of some of these uh, knowledge-related global public goods showed that 52% of total expenditures were out-of-pocket. And as you know, out-of-pocket expenditure is the worst form to finance a health system because it is inefficient and it is unfair. It is unfair because, you know, again, and the, here we go back to the ethical pillar because of a very simple notion. Disease is not the fault of people, and therefore a health system that places the financial burden on the sickest is inherently unfair. Access to healthcare cannot be part of the reward system in a society. Access to healthcare is the condition for a fair distribution of the benefits in any society. If you don't have 
uh, universal access to health and education, everything else that gets distributed in a society is unfairly determined because you have not given the same opportunities to everyone. Well, that uh, basic notion clashes with a health system that's financed by out-of-pocket payment because it makes the sickest pay the most. So it's inherently unfair. But it's also inefficient because of a small detail of the characteristic, uh, the small characteristic of uh, health phenomena, and that is uncertainty. None of us knows exactly when we will become sick or we will suffer a serious accident or an injury. And therefore, if you leave payment to the moment when you are um, actually need care, you run the risk of that uh, payment being catastrophic. And as I just mentioned a while ago, we documented that there were millions of households. And a recent paper also published by, by The Lancet documents that this is a widespread phenomenon throughout the developing world. Millions and millions of, of, people, of households becoming impoverished and falling into what I would call an unacceptable paradox. We know today that health is probably one of the most potent instruments that we have to empower people to lift themselves out of poverty. And the paradox is that when societies don't have the social instruments to achieve fair financing, healthcare can itself become an impoverishing factor for families. So rather than being a, a, a powerful tool to fight poverty, paying for healthcare becomes an impoverishing factor. And this is exactly the paradox that the reform in Mexico tried to uh, deal with. How did it do it? Well, armed with this technical pillar of the evidence and with the ethical deliberation that uh, healthcare is a human right and that it has to be exercised in an equal manner with explicit entitlements, uh, we were able to persuade the Congress through the political pillar to uh, issue a new law, a new health law, or to make a very substantial reform of the health law. That, that law was approved in um, April of 2003 by a large majority, 94% of the vote in the Senate, from all political parties. Now, many of you must know that Mexico has become a normal democracy after uh, seven decades of a very peculiar democracy, a one-party system. Well, now it is a normal democracy with um, a highly uh, divisive political process. It was possible, through the ethical deliberation, to focus the agreement of all parties on this one law. We could disagree on everything else like a vigorous democracy, pluralistic democracy, like the one we're trying to build in Mexico. We could disagree on many things. But this became an issue where everyone could bridge their differences and come and sit around the idea that we had to have universal health insurance. The law came into effect on January 1st, 2004. So we just are finishing the, three year, the third year of implementation. And what the law does is it gives seven years from 1st January 2004 to 2010 to enroll 50 million persons, half of the population, who were uninsured before the reform was passed. Who are these 50 million? All the people that work on their own and therefore had been excluded from conventional social insurance, which we have had in Mexico since 1943. But like in most developing countries, social insurance was tied to formal employment. There is also one developed country where insurance is employment mediated. Again, it shall remain unnamed. But this is the standard in the poor world. So social insurance is highly limited. And, uh, and, and what we were able to do was to break the dependence of social insurance coverage on salaried formal employment and financing through payroll taxation. The instrument has been a new insurance scheme which we have called popular health insurance, or Seguro Popular in Spanish. It is a, um, a, a very interesting scheme that I'll very briefly describe, again, because the papers contain a lot of detailed description, and, um, and, and, uh, uh, and that's now enrolling these 50 million people over a seven-year period. Now, seven years might sound like a lot. Um, certainly, there's many biblical um, curses that lasted seven years. Seven years means that we have to enroll 1.7 million uh, families, we enroll whole families, per year. And that's a huge logistical operation. And um, fortunately, we're right on time. We finished the administration on November 31st, issuing the policy number 5.1 million 
5.1 million families, about 22 million people are already enrolled and we're right on target to be able to enroll the 50 million people by the year 2010. But the important thing here is not enrolling people. You're enrolling them so that they can actually exercise the right to health, as I said at, at, at the beginning. The important thing here is that the law makes explicit the entitlements and then, for the first time in Mexico, it stipulates the budgetary obligations of the federal and state governments to fund access to those entitlements. And that has been, I think, the revolutionary component. Instead of the traditional way in which we fund health systems, where we budget inputs and we subsidize the supply, here we put the whole budgeting process on its head. We start by saying, what are the rights of people? Not the abstract right to health care. What does it include? So we develop a package of interventions. We cost that, and then we say, in order to be able to deliver this and then allow people to exercise their, their right, this is how much it costs per family. And therefore, this is what the federal and the state governments must provide in their budgets. So thanks to this um, uh, mechanism, uh, it was possible to write into law a solution for the underfunding problem that was, as I mentioned a while ago, part of, the, of our point of departure. We had underfunded systems, not in the abstract, underfunding to deal with the double burden of disease. That has made it possible to shift from the old style of what I call bureaucratic budgeting, where you simply fund buildings, you pay the payroll of uh, doctors and nurses, uh, uh, you subsidize the supply of services without regard to performance, and move from, away from that kind of bureaucratic budgeting to democratic budgeting, where money literally follows people. Because what we're doing is we're starting with the needs of people and then subsidizing their demand for health services to meet those needs. Enrollment in the Seguro Popular is voluntary. Provision of services is the responsibility of states. So states now have the incentive to keep quality high because if people disenroll from the insurance scheme, they lose the federal subsidy, which is the largest part of their uh, money to provide health care. So this has completely realigned the incentives. Therefore, in, in, in summary, this reform has a macro, a macro level financing component, a whole new way of analyzing the financial, uh, uh, pr the problem of financing, beginning with the health needs, and then working your way through the budget rather than beginning with the inputs, you begin with the outcomes you're expecting. This has allowed, by writing this into law, to double the budget of the Ministry of Health, that is to say, the, the, the budget for the care of the uninsured, the previously uninsured population. During my six years as minister, it grew to more than, more than double, and when you take away the effect of inflation, it meant an increase of 69% in real terms, which we had never had in, 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 in the history, at least the recent history of Mexico. But it was done in a way where, you know, we were not just asking for more money. We were saying what that was going to be used for, how many kids with cancer were going to be treated, how many uh, cases of uh, pre prevention of uh, HIV was going to be funded by this, by this scheme. Then that macro-level reform is complemented by a micro-level uh, uh, reform looking at improving the quality of health services through a number of very specific interventions, better information systems. If you move from a supply to a demand side subsidy, you need a whole new information system, incentives for uh, uh, health personnel to perform better, uh, accreditation of facilities. The law requires facilities to be accredited in order to participate in this uh, insurance scheme and a number of other tools. And then the point that articulates the macro reform, financing reform, with the micro level changes that are geared at changing the incentives is the explicit package of benefits. Now, again, this university has done a lot to advance, but we tend to present the package as a technocratic tool using cost and effectiveness to define what are the best buys in healthcare. 
A package is that, certainly. It's a way of improving allocational efficiency. But it's much, much more. Much more. First of all, it makes entitlements explicit. Rather than just declaring that there is a right to health care, it makes a, 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 a entitlements explicit. And therefore, it has a direct link to the ethical and the political framework. Second, it makes it possible to estimate the financial requirements, as I just explained. First, th thirdly, it gives you the blueprint to plan what facilities you will require, what sort of equipment you will need, and what staffing pattern. If this is the package you need to, to deliver, what are the human resources and the staffing requirements to actually deliver that package? And fourthly, it makes it possible to have a process of accreditation of quality, because now we accredit units precisely so that they are proven to be capable of delivering that package of benefits. And probably most important, the package has been proven to be the very powerful tool to bridge the traditional divide we have had in public health, and I'm sure all of you are very well aware, between the vertical approach to public health where you take one disease at a time and you have very focused priorities, and the horizontal approach that looks at strengthening the health system in general, but without clear priorities. And let me tell you one thing, in poor countries, if you plan to strengthen the health system in general without clear priorities, you will invariably strengthen those parts that disproportionately benefit the richest parts of society. That's, you know, that's part of the definition of being underdeveloped. It's precisely that that's the likely outcome. So what, you, what we have tried to implement in Mexico is not the vertical approach, not the horizontal approach, but the diagonal approach. We extend the geometry metaphor. You need to get a diagonal approach. What is a diagonal approach? A process in which you have clear, in, in which you use clear priorities to drive general improvements in the health system. Maternal mortality, which for us is the MDG where we're lagging the most. You can only reduce maternal mortality if you have a well-functioning health system. But you use that to focus your attention, not to leave strengthening of health system to, 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 to whatever demand is spontaneously generated by the population, but to have a clear sense of priorities. We decided that we would target universal coverage uh, against um, uh, HIV AIDS, so universal coverage with comprehensive care, including antiretrovirals. Well, the way to do it was to say that any uninsured person that required AIDS treatment would automatically be eligible to get enrolled into the new Seguro Popular. Now that made people understand what the new insurance was all about because you were able to link the insurance scheme to a very concrete disease problem. And therefore, this is a, an example of the diagonal approach. You use that disease problem to structure the new insurance scheme and so forth. And finally, let me say, that the, that the, um, the new uh, insurance scheme and the package has not been limited only to personal health services, diagnostic, preventive, and therapeutic services for the individual. One interesting lesson we, we had learned from other reform experiences was that in this kind of financial reforms, it's very common that one neglects community health services. Those services where there's no spontaneous demand from the population or that represent truly public goods, like, you know, good epidemiological surveillance. Typically, because the political pressure is usually to fund personal health services, the financial reforms tend to neglect some of these community services. You know, um, how do you fund uh, vector control? I mean, the mosquito doesn't go flying and asking people if they're insured or uninsured. You, you, you obviously it's a public good, but therefore, you know, there, there, there is no spontaneous demand for that. It's just assumed that that will be funded. If you're not careful, you will end up underfunding those services. How do you uh, uh, fund epidemiological surveillance? These are typically public goods that only are noticeable when they fail. A big part of our problem in public health is that our main victories are the absence of outcomes. And that's very, very tough to sell. <laughs> when your victory is the absence of outcomes. Um, when we had, you know, the SARS incident, I went to the president and said, you know, no one has come to congratulate me, Mr. President. There was no SARS in Mexico. I said, no, of course, I mean, no one noticed. 
Of course, if we had had a case, you know, I, my head would have been chopped. I would have been the... But this is our problem. That part of our endeavor, which is the core of public health, simply will tend to be underfunded. And uh, I have to say I have benefited a lot from studying reforms in other countries. And this was one reform after reform, one area that tended to be neglected. So for the first time, the law creates a separate fund called um, a, a, a contributory fund to finance uh, community health services, as, as they are called. Um, and that has allowed us to bridge another divide, just like we have the divide in public it between vertical and horizontal. We have had this eternal debate between sectoral interventions and intersectoral or action on the determinants of health. A lot of these community-based interventions do deal with uh, the determinants of health, but now they can be adequately funded. I mean, to me, it's very clear that it is not enough to have health policy in the strict sectorial sense of the word, but that we need healthy policies where we mobilize every tool of public policy to advance the social objective of better health. So health is not just a specialized sector of public administration, it is a social objective. The best example, of course, is um, fiscal policy. You know, we raise taxes on tobacco, not because of, uh, we want to, to, to get more, more money from taxes, but because we know it is the most powerful intervention to reduce smoking among young people. So a good Minister of Health has to be able to mobilize all the other tools of public policy to advance health as a social objective. And that is a key and essential part of the job of a Ministry of Health. We're not in charge of road safety, but we are in charge of making sure that pedestrians are protected and people who go in cars are protected and that the necessary regulations are protected. So to achieve this, one important part of my job was uh, to create a whole new public health agency. We did a major reorganization. And now Mexico has, I think, uh, a, a, a modern uh, public health agency that deals with the core instruments of applying the law to protect people from various risks to their health. So um, in, in, in summary, um, uh, and by the way, this uh, new agency is also a fundamental tool also for risks that are generated in the process of globalization. The health implications of international trade, for example, when you deal with issues like food safety, you have to have modern agencies that can protect the public's health when you have a, 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 a trading system that's uh, as open as it, as it is uh, today. So this was a key component of this reform. Uh, it's gotten much less attention in the media uh, than the insurance component in, in and of itself because of the nature of public health. But I didn't want to um, be remiss in being here at the School of Public Health and particularly at the cafeteria, such a, <laughs> an important element to satisfy a basic human need to reinforce that the nuts and bolts of public health lie in these sort of actions and that we must not forget that component in our, our, our health system reform. Public health is a part of the health system. The health system is not just the curative or the personal health services. It includes the public health instruments to really have not just a health policy but a healthy policy and mobilize all the tools from all the sectors. And therefore, bridge that divide. It's not one or the other. It's both. A comprehensive health system reform has to take account of both sides of the equation. Let me finish. Um, so we open it for discussion uh, by summarizing what lessons I, I think uh, we have learned. And in, in the first of the papers in the Lancet series, I came up with this um, um, uh, device to, to remember the lessons uh, of, uh, of, of the Mexican experience. And I call it the A, B, C, D, E of successful reform. It was going to be called first the A, B, C, but uh, that has been discredited in some other uh, applications. So we made it the A, B, C, D, E of successful reform. The A is for agenda. It is fundamentally critical to link health to the broader societal concerns. We must break loose from health being strictly a, the, the, the concern of specialists and make sure we are able to demonstrate the relevance of investing in health for development, for security. We have greatly benefited from SARS and from the threat of human influenza because it, has it, it, it makes the health endeavor much more visible. Most policymakers are concerned 
with health as an instrumental value. Now, for us, health professional, health is intrinsically valued, and that is a central part of our ethical framework. But, we, but, but in addition to underscoring the intrinsic value of health as a human right, we must have the skill to link it and to establish its relevance to the broader agenda that preoccupies other decision makers. I didn't get the Minister of Finance of Mexico to accept you know, something that's like poison to any Minister of Finance, which is entitlements. Ministers of Finance hate that because it reduces their freedom to allocate the budget. And any standard economist will say, no, no, you should not you know, um, make your budget allocation decisions rigid by establishing entitlements. Well, I, I don't agree. If the entitlements are good things, thank God we, we have rigidities because, you know, you don't want a society where you cut health insurance to finance uh, war efforts. You don't want that. You want some of those rigidities. But how do you convince a Minister of Finance of that? You convince that by showing that this, apart from its intrinsically intrinsic value, is going to be very positive for economic growth in Mexico. You do that by bringing very good analysis that the current the system we had for financing out of pocket was having a major impact on, for example, saving rates in Mexico. That having an unhealthy population was having a major, was being a major hurdle to economic development. So the A for agenda is the need to use good evidence to make the case that good health serves to fight poverty, generate employment, protect savings, make your labor force more productive, enhance the effectiveness and the efficiency of your investments in human capital through education, and in general, to contribute to economic welfare and to better security. If you manage then to put health in the center of that broader agenda, then you can move to the B, the budget. And of course, a big lesson from Mexico is that you, certain areas of of a budget have to be preserved, particularly in a pluralistic democracy. You need to be able to allocate the, or to define the, 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 the budget uh, with reference to some objective criteria to insulate the health budget from political manipulation, which is not an uncommon uh, reality in, 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 in our countries. And the main, I think, achievement was that we were able now to write into law what are the benefits? By starting with the benefits, we were able to work our way to the budgetary obligations of the federal and state governments. Now, this is a huge improvement. The last two budgets in Mexico, both the Ministry of Finance and the Congress simply read the law and approved the budget. In the past, the Ministry of Health, including yours truly, had to go cup in hand, beg to the Ministry of Finance for a little bit of budget, it's, it's over. It's now in the law, and it's linked to entitlements. And now you also create a, a social movement to defend those allocations. So the budget is very important, and I know there will be many economists in the room who will take issue with this, po this point. This is, uh, this is, uh, but but I, I hope we can, we can debate. I think certain entitlements are fundamental, and health-related entitlements are very important. However, as the legendary Professor Ramalinga Swami from India said, it's not enough to get more money for health. We need to demonstrate more health for the money. And that brings us to the C, capacity. All that money that you're getting, the extra budget, has to be invested in building up capacity. And capacity has two main components. Obviously, the first one is the capacity to deliver high-quality health services. So an integral part of the uh, reform has been to, we, we wrote into the law, our obligation to stipulate three master plans for investment, facilities, technology, and human resources. And now we have to produce every year on a rational basis what facilities will be built on a, on a, on a long-term uh, 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 time frame with what kind of ado adop adoption of technology. You can use a lot of this money simply to buy in an irrational way technology. And as you know, developing countries have higher uh, density of high-cost technology than rich countries because we don't do our planning work correctly. And this morning, talking to Don Berwick, I discovered that this is another divide that we were able to bridge, the, the, the divide between 
market solutions where people are given choice and state control solutions where you plan. But you need both. You need to actually give more choice to, to people, but provide a structure framework for planning of, of facilities and building up that capacity. But capacity also includes research and analysis. This reform benefited from 20 years of investments in institution building, institutions like the National Institute of Public Health or the Mexican Health Foundation. And this is, again, a part where Harvard has played a central role in building, in, in helping Mexico to build some of those uh, uh, institutions. Um, and that brings me then to the D, is the, the deliverables, the concrete benefits to, to people. The only way in which you can link some of these abstract notions of financing and management and build support for people is through the explicit package of benefits that I've already commented on. You then can focalize the attention of the public in the concrete benefits that derive from a reform like this. And you also make yourself accountable to not just getting more money for health, but for more health for the money. How many, uh, what are the benefits, what are the, out, the, the, the outcomes that we are achieving? And finally, the E is the evidence, E for evidence. Um, I already mentioned the three mechanisms through which knowledge improves health. Um, we need to make the case that uh, all of these reforms have to have a solid evidence base. And that will allow us to bridge two more divides. One between analysis and action. I think the Mexican reform is an example of how science can actually fuel social change. And the other is the uh, false dilemma between local and global research. This is again a case where global knowledge public goods are brought to the center of the domestic policy agenda to transform a, a local reality and then we need to close that circle by building up the evidence and feeding back into the global pool of knowledge to, in order to engage in a process of shared learning among countries. And this is again a big role for universities like Harvard University systematizing this evidence, but we need the institutions that will carry out that work, making sure that we document whatever works and doesn't work in the health systems area so that we um, countries can learn from each other, uh, very importantly, not to repeat mistakes, uh, also to learn what's, what's good. Um, and that's why this reform has had a very big component of external evaluation that, as I mentioned at the beginning, is being carried out uh, here in Harvard, and one of the papers has the uh, initial results. I like to say that to reform, we must inform, or else we will deform the health system. So uh, uh, getting good evaluation and making that part of the evidence base is another way of um, closing that, that uh, virtuous cycle. I would say in, in, in the final analysis, that um, what happened in Mexico and during these six years is that we began to rewrite the social contract for health. This is a contract that every society establishes among three groups of citizens, and these are obviously not mutually exclusive groups, but citizens in three roles. Citizens as users of the health services, citizens as providers of health care, and citizens as taxpayers who fund the health system. And the contract among those three defines what is a health system. What we did is we began. We have not rewritten the contract. The reform is ongoing and has four more years to go, and then it will again become victim of its success, and we will have to have another way of reform, wave of reform. But we did begin to rewrite the social contract among citizens. For citizens as users, which is everyone, because we will all one day be users of the health system, and if public health is a part, we are all part of the health system. So for them, equal rights. The, social, the new social contract for health says that healthcare is not a privilege, it's not a merchandise you purchase, it's a social right that needs to be exercised in an inclusive and egalitarian manner. For citizens as providers, the new social contract says that if you excel, you will be rewarded, that you don't need to sink into mediocrity, but that we will have a system of democratic budgeting where good quality is recognized and rewarded and when you generate the means, the resources, to provide, the, to, to give the providers the tools to actually deliver high quality care. And for citizens as taxpayers who work in order to finance this health system, the new social contracts 
gives assurances of accountability and transparency. We now know, we can now explain to a citizen why the budget is the size it is and what is it buying in terms of that package of benefits. So the value of giving the taxpayers really the capacity to explain exactly how their money is spent is a key part of the new social contract for health. So in conclusion, let me say, uh, let, let me close by saying that uh, from all that you have heard this afternoon, I think it should be very clear that I have made the pilgrimage, the pilgrimage to this temple of higher learning with one major objective this afternoon. And my major objective is, has been to say thank you. Thank you because you have been such a central part of the intense change process that has been maturing in Mexico over the past 15 years, when I first came here in 1992, and from all the work that came before that we have actually benefited from. Thank you for having accompanied uh, me personally and, and many members of the Ministry of Health who are alumni of this school and who keep very active links to the School of Public Health along this very, very in intense uh, experience of the, last, uh, of, of, the, of, of the last six years. And finally, thank you for having me invited back here really to start a new cycle in this upward spiral of our common search for better health. Thank you very much. The floor is open for comments and questions. It's hard to see up here, so perk up. Oh, yes. You want me? You have a question? Juan Liu uh, of the Department of Population and International Health. Uh, Julio, even though you didn't get to be the WHO Direct General, as many of us uh, hoped you would, I'd like to congratulate you on standing tall on your ethical and uh, uh, technical pillars. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Margaret Chan's political pillar uh, turned out to be the deciding factor in the last race. Uh, my question is this. You briefly mentioned your marvelous uh, speech that uh, you uh, exerted a tremendous effort on restructuring the health uh, organizations. Uh, you created a new set of uh, uh, modern uh, public health institutions, which turned out to be uh, a, a very important contributing factor to the success of Mexico's health reform. Can you elaborate on what those new agencies are and how they function? Yes, um, uh, just um, an editorial comment on, on <laughs> the WHO. Uh, it was a fascinating process because, um, uh, you know, a person from a developing country like myself was able to mount a campaign based only on a platform of what I've been telling you. So I was truly just being the, the candidate of the work of many, many people, including, like I just said, very sincerely, a lot of people in this room who have helped this process a lot. Um, you know, the positive side of this is that in process that we know are very much influenced by geopolitics, that a candidate that was only running on a platform of, of things like I've been talking about this afternoon was able to get so far. So if we look at it, it is... Uh, actually, a, I think uh, the possibility of beginning to change some of the elements and make this more of a merit-based uh, competition. Uh, but you know, uh, if, if, uh, if, if we were able to change some rules, I think this would be a fundamental part of the reform of our multilateral system. And the rules are very simple. We live in a very schizophrenic reality. Because most countries, most democracies in the world, will apply certain rules to their elections. And yet we don't apply the same rules to our international organizations. So if we simply applied the same rules that we, the same countries, apply to our internal elections, for example, rules on finance limits, it would be inconceivable in any mature democracy that you would allow elections where there's no finance limits because then you don't have a level playing field. Well, we just need to do that in our international agencies. And then I think um, 
uh, the next person who runs strictly on merit and not on unlimited financing will uh, make it to the end. But, you know, uh, having uh, gone all the way as far as I, as I did on the basis of this platform, I think for me is a, is a, is a great uh, reason for hope. Uh, but we still need to do those reforms. The, uh, I, I refer specifically to the new public health agency. Um, we used to have a highly bureaucratized process for the core elements of public health dealing you know, with uh, the, the, the regulatory aspects where we utilize legal and regulatory instruments to protect the, the health of people. All that, those uh, uh, core functions of public health like um, determining acceptable levels of environmental or, or occupational exposures, assuring uh, food safety, uh, 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 regulating the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and so forth, were in, in, in the ministry were completely dispersed, uh, highly fragmented, very prone to corruption. And what we did, and it was a key part of this reform, was to rearrange, do a major institutional reform to bring that together into a new agency called the Federal uh, Commission for Protection Against Health Risks and uh, make it into a very modern, transparent, effective uh, instrument that I would say is the equivalent of the FDA here with um, elements from OSHA and, and EPA because it also sets environmental and occupational exposures. Um, now, that's the neglected part of, of health systems. And one of the things I'm very proud of is I am the first Minister of Health of Mexico uh, since uh, the ministry was created in 1943 who has formal training in public health. And so for me it was very important that actually, because you know, there will be a tendency to appoint other people uh, with political credentials or other, other, other reasons to create an institutional setting where it's not dependent on the fact that the minister in turn is convinced about the value of public health, but you actually have the institution and then you have a separate fund within the reform to finance a lot of these public, public goods related to health. But that was the, the new agency and I, uh, we've, we've um, done a, a lot um, of description about what it is. I think it's been a, a model of a complete re-engineering of those uh, core functions. But today, you know, we have a, a, a very powerful instrument to stand up to powerful economic interests that very often represent a threat to health, uh, like tobacco or like you know, the food industry. We, 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 and this is a lot of what the, you know, the basic stewardship role of modern ministries of health uh, uh, has to do with. It's, it's not, uh, uh, stewardship is about setting rules of the game to promote the supreme value, the superior value of health. And uh, we now have an instrument to do that in the ministry, which we didn't have before.